There are difficult tracks to master, there are difficult tracks to drive, and then there is the Nürburgring, 170 of the most challenging corners for any driver to experience anywhere. Hello everyone and welcome to round 12 of the Radical Racing Challenge brought to you here live on Apex Racing TV. My name is DJ Clark, joined here on the commentary booth by Aaron Smith with our director Samuli Kumo behind uh, the scenes. And Aaron, it's the Norch life. What else is there to say about this circuit? Not really much else. You kind of summed it up perfectly. It's the crown jewel of the Radicals. We do this every single season, and it's the most hotly anticipated race for these drivers all season long. And I think we're going to get an absolutely incredible race, as we always do around here. It's going to be chaotic. It's going to be close. It's the Notch Life, the Green Hell, whatever nickname you want to give it. But I can tell you that we are in for some fantastic racing. Yeah, we most certainly are. Not all that many places to overtake around here, but it's going to favor the bold who are going to be able to do it. Obviously, the main area that we're going to see a lot of overtaking will be on the Dottinger Hoa uh, going down that long, long straightaway using the draft of these Radical SR10s to try to pull themselves ahead. Right now, we keep our eyes on Lasse Sorensen working his way around here in a seven-minute practice. It's a bit of a strange session uh, as we run things as it is every year because of the long nature of this circuit. Everybody qualifies beforehand, so the grid is already set here, and we're basically just waiting to get going. Yeah, we've got about 20 seconds until these guys uh, actually can start gridding up. Uh, speaking of uh, Sorensen, he is starting a little bit further down than he probably would have liked in 14th place, though that kind of matches uh, with his number quite perfectly, although he is the number 13, so yeah, he might be uh, hoping for better luck, but... Yeah, especially that first sector, I think we're going to see on this lap one. It's, it's kind of make or break. You either see a massive pile up or everyone takes it way too cautiously and everyone's just too slow and then gets clogged up up the hill. Yeah, indeed, and we'll have to see how that all plays itself out. But now, as we switch over and get ready to grid, let's run you through the qualifying order. It's going to be Philip Herc in pole position, followed by Rafael Blanco, then Michael Bell and Dominic Gross. Daniel Sedgley lines up P5, followed by Chris Brendan, with uh, Marcus Ribizark there in P7. Then it's going to be Hannes Kester in 8, followed by Pedro Amor and uh, Albert Fuchs in 10th place. Phelan Pritchard will line up in 11th, followed by Nicholas Paulus in P12. 13th will be Hesterman and Sorensen in that row. Then it's going to be Casanovas and Robert Woodward. Enrico Bertot will be 17th. Ewan Bremer will be in 18th. Mika Hulkanen will be in 19th. Then Christopher Lemayne and Daniel Pereira will round out your 21 car grid. And thankfully, a short pace lap here, as is the case. We don't have a whole lot for these cars to get going. Uh, and indeed, it's a standing start here, uh, excuse me, uh, for them to get going. You'd think after 12 weeks I would uh, have that committed to memory but uh, there we hear the engines starting to harmonize and we see five lights as there goes the green and we are racing at the Nürburgring it is a brilliant getaway there from Rafael Blanco able to get out into the lead of the race it looks there like uh, we had a couple of drivers just slow off of the start Aaron I'm not sure what happened yeah, some of them really not getting away as they would like, of course, in these cars. You do have to use a clutch to get an ideal getaway. And as we saw last week at Bathurst, Blanco getting a storming start off the grid, making his way up into the lead. And here's the incidents I was talking about. And that's Robert Woodward with no rear wing on the back of his Radical SR10. He, not the start he would be looking for as Hesterman and Hulkenen also looks to be involved in that. Although I do think Hesterman did start from the pit lane. But yeah, Blanco, the same as we saw last week. He made his way into the lead off the start. I think he started uh, in second, so not quite as impressive as before, but he's now back into the lead and can he hold it? Yeah, that's going to be the real question. A little farther down in the field, we ride on board with Bremer right now. We saw a couple of moves up ahead. Casanovas and Pritchard right to the head of him. It looks here like Casanovas is being very, very aggressive as they fly over the crest of the hill. Obviously, that being one of the jumps that used to exist here in the lower downforce cars. Good move to the inside here for Casanovas. He's going to try to make that move going into Arenberg, and it looks like he's going to be able to pull it off and Sedgley off. 
Yeah, essentially, Daphne probably just outbroke himself. One of the easiest places to mess up on this entire track, just going a little bit too deep into that corner. But yeah, the, the midfield very, very close right now. And I think only the top 14 drivers actually did attempt a qualifying lap. But yeah, essentially falling away, now down to 15th from 5th. Not the start he was looking for, and we'll see what he will be able to do in the coming minutes uh, over the course of this next lap. But yeah, the grid shuffling quite nicely. Not one driver actually staying in the place that they started. Uh, our pole sitter, Philip Van Den Hoek, got a terrible start and is now down in fourth. And something else happened up above, and that's two cars off. It's oh. Pedro Amor essentially getting right into him. I see Amor and Sedgley off there. A couple of drivers taking a tow there. Woodward back in the pits. Bremer as well. Hulkinen involved in that incident as well. I'm not entirely sure what happened. We just sort of glanced on the screen and we saw calamity taking place in front of us. Let's watch Marcus here on the number 19 machine. Car off in front of him. Looks like that didn't affect him here. Oh, yes, it did. The number 17. That's Pedro Amor getting a big, big chunk of grass spinning around and that's what caused the stack up yeah another really easy place uh, to go wide get on the grass and just mess all of your racing lines up and yeah Sedgley also getting caught up in that his race has gone from bad to worse he's back in the pits and uh, yeah speaking of we have five drivers already towing it's only 16 left in this race it'll be interesting to see if any of them do come and try and get back out on the track I doubt it but uh, Blanco doing well in the lead, and that's Fuchs trying to uh, pip a move on Cassette, uh, driver in front of him. And yes, a lot of these guys being very, very aggressive on this opening lap, and well, it's, it's very entertaining for us, but oh, this is very squeaky bum time going into this next corner. Not really a corner you want to be going side by side through, and Fuchs just backs out of it and lives to fight another day. Yeah, discretion proving the better part of Valor there for Fuchs, and I've got to agree with that as Case Decur uh, here trying to hold on. He's in a little bit of a battle himself with Redman up ahead of him as they work their way through Bergberg right there. Bringing the cars around right now, coming back on to uh, some of the longer stretches here down into the carousel. Excuse me, that was uh, the hairpin before the carousel as now they bring their way back out and around. Such a difficult corner to get right. You carry a little bit too much speed through there and you're going to find yourself in trouble. And I'll tell you what, it looks here like Hoops is back on the attack was all up behind Kastiker there, trying to see if he was able to get a move. Didn't look like it was able to play, but certainly trying to get into the head there of the number 16, maybe seeing if he can force an error at this stage in the race. Yeah, I mean, we already have seen a bunch of errors from these guys, so it would not be surprising if we saw another one. But at the moment in this section, it's very beautiful to drive through, but not really any overtaking opportunities unless the person in front of you makes a mistake or runs wide so i think fuchs is just gonna have to wait for that very long back straight for the moment not really much he can do at the moment just keep on the back of that number 13 but meanwhile blanco doing well in the lead about a second ahead of bell behind him but as we saw last week blanco is prone to making those mistakes and i hope and wonder that he can continue on today and get redemption for last week but we will wait and see as there's bell going very wide then, just keeping it on the track as he tries to push to catch up to Blanco. It is about a second now, which is mm, teetering on the edge of Slipstream. And uh, I believe there's been some more incidents in the background as uh, people in game chat are going completely berserk. But yeah, we'll, we'll wait and see what happens with these top three. But I think Philip Van Den will want to be getting back into that top three where he belongs. Yeah, I certainly think he will as well. And it looks like here at this point, he's going to be close enough behind Dominic Gross that he will be able to get a good draft uh, on the Dottinger Hoa, which they're going to enter onto right about now. There you can see that long, long main straightaway. The one problem is going to be here uh, for uh, Vandenherk and Gross is that they find themselves about a second and a half behind Bell and Blanco. So they're really not going to be able to get any effect from that slipstream. Although Bell was able to have a good last part of that lap. And 
that's going to allow for him to close up behind. You can see those gaps just coming down as they work their way through. Really impressive stuff. Let's see if Bell's going to be close enough. I don't think he is, but that draft certainly giving him enough to hold on to. Vandenberg able to regain into third behind, as we said, as they work their way here through uh, the last couple of corners and start on lap two of what will be a four lap race around this circuit. Yeah, very, very chaotic opening lap as uh, I masterfully predicted. But uh, speaking of Willet van Den, he was, I saw on those qualifying laps, he was about nearly three seconds ahead of anyone else, which round here, to be fair, isn't actually that much time. But I mean, three seconds, it's, it's, it's still a staggering gap. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if he catched up to Bell and Blanca in front. It will be difficult considering the draft, but I think we've got a spicy race for the top three on our hands, and yeah, we still got about three and a half laps to go. Yeah, I've, I've got to agree with you there. It does look like here at this point that Dominic Gross, though, is, is losing touch with Vandenherk up in front of him. Vandenherk looking like he's gotten back into the groove and is able to push ahead. And, and you know as well as I do, Aaron, that so much of being able to execute on this uh, Nordschleife circuit is really and truly a about finding that rhythm, finding that way around. If you know the circuit well, you find that groove, and that is just going to lead you to better and better positioning. Oh, 100%. This, this track brings out the best of drivers, no matter what category you're doing, whatever car you're in, whatever drivers you've got, it's going to bring out the best. As Bell getting very close to the back of Blanco, but not really anywhere he can put his car alongside Blanco, as Blanco goes a little bit defensive, but at the moment I think he's got this one in the bag, but that gap is coming down, and maybe Bell will try and have a go through here. It is going to be tight if he does, but I think he's just going to have to sit behind again. This is the one bad thing about the Notch Life, is you have to be so, so careful about where you pick your moves, because if you get it wrong, well, yeah, I mean, the barriers are looking pretty tasty, and so are they for the driver in front of you. Yeah, very much so. If you're going to make a move, you not only need to consider any danger that you can have to your car, but if you put that driver off in front of you a little bit, it's not out of the question for them to sort of ping pong across the track and collect you as they now work their way down into the dropping left-hander here that will lead them back around into Exmula, trying to see what they are able to get. Coming towards the back half of the circuit, it looks like Bell's lost a couple of tenths of a second. He was all over the rear wing of Blanco, but not quite able to keep it, but as you've said, I, I think the strategy here for Bell is just keep yourself within striking range and try to apply a little bit of pressure. Not necessarily to go for the full out move, but just see if you can maybe force a mistake out of that number one in front of you. Definitely. It's it's just mind games around here. It's not the bang average racing that we get around any other track like maybe we had a Bathurst or that that is still a completely different kettle of fish compared to any other track but this is well compared to bathurst i mean this is like a whale and bathurst is more like a little goldfish Th this track provides some absolutely spectacular racing if you can get it right and i think bell uh, again just doesn't have any opportunity to go for a move it's it's the, it's so fine on this track the margins are so so fine and he's gonna have to be really smart and i think the only opportunity he's really got is down that back straight on the final part of the track. And he's just got to stick with Blanco, hope he maybe makes a mistake. And uh, while well, these guys are completely ignoring my advice, as, oh, that's car going very, very wide. That's Perea getting it all wrong through that fast left-hander and just about keeping it out of the wall. And that's Michael Bell, who seems to have made a mistake and has now allowed Philip Van Den Hoek into second place. And while we were viewing the other battle, Phil, uh, Michael Bell has made some kind of mistake and could have cost him the victory. Yeah, it certainly could have. And now Vandenhark is going to have it all to do here because he's got to try to gain up about 1.9 seconds on Blanco up ahead of him. Vandenhark uh, definitely pushing there. Let's see if we can go back and see exactly what happened to Michael Bell here, the Australian driver. This is going to be coming down into the carousel. Watching the number four come out of the corner. Oh, he came out of the banking a little bit early. He is a lucky, lucky driver. That wasn't worse. 
Yeah, if, if you do that, if maybe he'd gone a little bit earlier, he could have ended up on that oh. curb and in the wall. He is one lucky guy. Sure, he lost a place from it, but yeah, that, <laughs> that was uh, scary to say the least. But yeah, Philip Van Den has it all to do. But at the moment, he has he managed to catch Bell very quickly, regardless on that last lap. And, well, if Philip Van Den has got the pace we believe he has, being around two and a half seconds quicker than anyone else, then, well, one and a half seconds should seem like a cake for Yeah, it certainly should. And look at that gap already on the left-hand side of your screen coming down from about that 1.9 to 1.5, 1.6 as they work their way through the mini carousel right now. Van Den Herk definitely coming on here. I'm not sure if he's going to run out of time necessarily, but I will say it's good for him in this position that he was able to get around Michael Bell. Bell looked like he struggled coming really from about the Stefan Belloff S all the way through the mini carousel. Now they're back on the Dottinger Hoa. Let's see here for Bell if he's going to be able to have a little bit of response. He finds himself about seven tenths of a second behind Philip Vandenherk. Now he's going to get some better speed here on the Dottinger Hoa. I don't think that's going to be enough to make a pass necessarily, but that could keep him in contention for that second place. Yeah, I think he will definitely get a top three today. I think that's a given. He does have some good pace, but just needs to keep it on the road. And yeah. Philip Van Den just outside of the zip chain from down that straight, so didn't really gain or lose any time. And he also was too far ahead for Michael Bell to actually give him maybe a bump drop if Michael Bell was feeling nice enough. But yeah, the look, look at that. Philip Van Den setting the fastest lap of the race by six tenths ahead of Blanco and nearly two seconds ahead of Michael Bell. So I think if Philip can keep it on the road this lap and push like hell, we could see a battle for the lead, maybe even halfway through this lap. Yeah, I've got to agree with you there. We'll have to really keep an eye how he does through these first couple of sectors. We frankly haven't had our eyes on him uh, at this point as he works his way through the right-hander now, coming down the hill a little bit, charging towards fluke plots, as uh, that is one of those areas where the cars would get a little bit of air back in the day. There is Flute Plots, as you can see it coming over that hill, that jump always terrifying, uh, particularly if you like to indulge on the uh, the Lotus 49s around here. It's one of the most terrifying things in the world, thankfully enough, downforce on these radicals that we're not getting any air. I would say maybe the IR01 is ever so slightly more terrifying on this track. But yeah, both, both of those in very close contention for being absolutely terrifying. I mean, any car around here is terrifying, but some more than others. As uh, we actually look at the battle for fifth place between Redman and Fuchs, as uh, Fuchs messing it up there, locking a break, which, as we know, as we've learned throughout this entire season and last season, that if you lock a break on these cars, well, goodbye to your steering for about 10 or 15 corners. And look at the speed that Redman has already gained, but can't quite get it through again. I wonder how many times I'll be saying that tonight. Oh, he can't find a way through. <laughs> Oh dear, this track is, is absolute hell for these drivers, it seems. But uh, yeah, pr providing some funny and pretty good racing so far. Yeah, it certainly is. And now as they come their way through this part of the track, there could be a chance or two, uh, maybe for Redmond to be able to get a move as they come it down and now through Adenauer Forest, uh, being able to get that run. Look at that run there from Chris Redmond, really and truly bringing on a good amount of steam here. Little flash of the headlights. He's trying to get into the head of Fuchs the best of his ability. I've got to respect the game there to be able to do it, but uh, the flashing of the headlights always a little bit of a divisive issue, whether you're on the sim here or in real life. I, I think it's fine. As there's another brake lock from Fuchs in front. His steering is really going to be suffering now, but uh, I, I think it's fine. You know, I, I think you know it's it's just part of the mind games, and if you can't handle them, then well, you know, you you pay dividends for it, but. Yeah, Redman just really struggling behind right now, losing uh, almost about four tenths through that last corner. But uh, he does seem to be the faster driver at the moment, but obviously we will see what that turns out to be. And uh, that's Perea. We've already seen him have a few incidents in this race, and there is another one as Hesterman goes past into 13th place, and he's beached it. Oh. High-sided himself there on the curb, trying to get it turned back around. Can he do it? Hey! 
Hey, he's back <laughs> out and going. And into 15th, the Iberian driver. Little bit of damage on the right side of that car, but uh, he'll at least be able to continue on and try to see the checkered flag here at this point. Yeah, I, th I think that's all he wants now. <laughs> There's not really much else he can do. Just kind of try and avoid people now uh, and hopefully make the best of people's incidents in front. But uh, now we go back to this battle, which we haven't seen go on uh, for about a lap or two. But uh, K-Stecker doing pretty well now. And that's... Oh, hello. D this battle continues, I guess. Bell makes his way back into second place. That was unexpected. That was completely unexpected. Let's take a look at this move. It's in the same area that Michael Bell was passed last time going down into the carousel, hearing that this is a mistake from Vandenherk. Virtually the same thing that allowed Bell on by, just carried a little bit too much speed into the carousel, came out of that banking, uh, and lost a position there for Vandenherk. Yeah, he, he just, as you said, went too quick into that corner and just understeered away from the carousel and went onto the line that realistically only F1, F1 uh, cars really take around that. But uh, yeah, that's that's really, really hurt these both of these drivers' chances of winning this race. And I think as long as Blanco can keep it on the road, I think he's going to have this victory in the bag. But we do have about a lap and a half to go. So of course, anything can happen. But I'm going to be really interested to see what these guys do now. Do they try and work together? Does Philip try and maybe give uh, Bell a little bit of a bump draft? We'll we'll just have to wait and find out. But ooh, drifting through that corner there, <laughs> that was impressive uh, car control from Michael Bell. But yeah, I, I think these two have really cost themselves a chance at victory. Yeah, I have to agree with you there, and and I think you're you're really seeing with that drift and everything else, and, and a little bit of a drift there again for Michael Bell. My goodness, that shows you just how hard that number four is pushing to try to keep ahead of Philip Vandenherk here. This is not only a battle, but this is a, a test of driving ability for Michael Bell, just trying to keep all four tires on the road and keep up good speed. Yeah, but it does seem like he's losing so much time to the driver ahead. And of course, down here, unless you have about eight tenths of a second gap, you're just going to get overtaken, as we will probably see as Philip tucks nicely into the slipstream as we now patiently wait for him to gain more speed. Gaining, 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 and he's going to pull alongside now and overtake. Look at that overspeed he has on Michael Bell, and is going to try and pull away from him now. And, well, we've got a lap to go here. And it's an advantage for Blanco at the moment, but we've seen how quick Philip can be. And um, he's got one more lap this season to try and get one more victory. Uh, we've got six minutes to go. Let's do this. Here we go. White flag in the air for these drivers. The gap between first and second standing pad at about 2.4 seconds as they run. Will they be able to do anything? We check a little farther back into the field. This is the battle that we were keeping our eye on. Lasse Sorensen able to get the move over Kastiker here. That is going to promote Sorensen up into seventh place and also make him the biggest mover of the race up seven. You said a little bit earlier that uh, it was a bit surprising to see him qualifying down in the order. Well, his race Space is certainly proving to be something to be reckoned with. 100%. I think his qualifying lap was around 10 seconds slower than the pole setter, but I think he was also the, the last to drive a two set of time. Everyone else behind him didn't actually set one. Uh, so may, maybe he just made a mistake on his quality lap. His last lap was around four seconds slower than our leader, which again might seem big, but remember this is the Notch Life, so those gaps are massively different from any other track. Uh, but yeah, he's had some pretty good race pace. I think he'll be able to hold on to seventh place. I think Kastiker is just a little bit slower than him right now. And he should hold on to seventh nicely as he's already pulled away a second. And a very impressive job by him to go up. As you said, seven places. Not an easy job around here. But taking advantage of other people's mistakes and of course being, well, quicker than those around him. He's managed to stick himself into the top seven and bag himself a decent result round here, which, I mean, pretty big flex round here, to be honest. Yeah, it certainly is. And I think a couple of those positions probably helped out by the incidents we saw earlier with Sedgley, Amor, Woodward, and uh, uh, Ribzark there. Uh, but uh, still a very impressive run.
nice little battle here, uh, maybe starting to develop between uh, Casanovas and Hesterman a little bit farther back. This is the battle for P12 as they come down into Aremberg right now, that long right-hander that leads down the hill here. Uh, and so uh, this is holding at about five-tenths of a second. Hesterman exactly where he qualified in 13th, but Manu Casanovas up three on the day to be in 12th. This gap is coming down. Hesterman looks like he's got some speed. Yeah, Hesterman really showing him showing his own in this uh, last little bit of the race. I mean, you know, it's the last lap. He's in 13th place, I think he said. Do you know, whatever, send it. Let's let's just go for it on this last lap. Possibly maybe the last race for him of the season in these radicals. Obviously, we don't know what he'll do after this. But this is the last broadcasted race, of course, for this season. And it's been an absolute joy to watch and compensate over these races. They're always so much fun to watch. And this is the most hotly anticipated race. But I'm also seeing a gap open up for 8th and 9th as uh, Kaisik are really struggling and has allowed uh, the car behind of Nicholas Pales to just slowly gain on him. And we could have another battle there as... Uh, Hulkinen, I think, has gone into the pit lane. He's not had a very good race, has he? Uh, but yeah, about for 8th and ninth, case, they are really struggling at the moment. Yeah, very much struggling. I wonder if he maybe overheated his tires a little bit, and that's what's forcing the struggle as we check in on this battle right now. There is Pales uh, right in behind him, Nicholas, uh, the French driver in the number five machine. You would expect he's got a little bit more speed on those numbers. Obviously, that an indication of their I rating is here. He's going to have a little bit of a look to the inside. Whoa, thought about not going for it, then thought about going for it. He's going to try to stick it out, and that is going to be Pales making the move. That was a very impressive move. I think Casey could just probably let him through the smarter choice there and allowing Pales to really take advantage of his overspeed in that slipstream. Had a very impressive round the outside. It was very much squeaky bum time. Goes a little bit wide there, but nevertheless, very good overtake from him. He's now just got to keep in front of him. And uh, I also noticed uh, as we were following the battle for the 12th place, Hesterman did get past Casanova, so I think he made a mistake. Uh, which allowed him to slip through. And that's Dominic Gross off the track. Oh, that's P4 having a little bit of a problem, and that's going to be right at about Hoa Oct, and that's going to allow for Dominic, uh, for, uh, excuse me, Albert Fuchs to be able to get on through in that number 12 machine. So Gross losing a position there on the final lap. Yeah, n not really what you want. Well, apart from if you're Albert Fuchs, he's not complaining. He's up into fourth place. Probably the most he's going to gain six places. Very impressive job. And uh, a lot of these drivers actually gained six places. Four drivers gaining six places now. But uh, at the moment, I, I think it's Michael Bell. He's had an incident. Oh my goodness, third place now having an incident there. He luckily had a pretty big gap of about 11 seconds back to Fuchs, but now that gap is going to be diminished down to about three seconds here. My goodness, all of these drivers struggling here in the final portion of the race on this last lap. You never would have thought to have seen it here. The number four, though, able to get back and going, but that's certainly got to play with his head a little bit. He's going to have to be a little bit cautious through these last couple of corners. Yeah, of course, we don't know if he has any damage or has absolutely destroyed his tyres. But uh, as now we look to Rafael Blanco, one of the only drivers not to make a mistake throughout this entire race. Kind of shows he deserved the race win today, making up for last week's blunder at Bathurst, where he really did throw away the win. Uh, but nevertheless, he's going to get probably, I mean, I don't want to jinx it. We've still got a few corners to go, but uh, he's most likely going to get the win here at the Nautch Life, which, as I said earlier, is a pretty big flex to get the most important win of the season around this track. It must be such a good feeling for him. And well, he's taken advantage of, advantage of other people's mistakes, got off the line well, and well, they say you don't win the race into turn one. Well, Rafael Blanco, once again, has he's proved wrong a few times today and across this whole season. Well, you can win if you push hard enough. Yes, indeed you can. Comes through the final corner, a flash of the headlights and across the checkered flag as the Uruguayan driver will take victory here at the Norch Life of Vandenherk is going to come home P2 and it looks like Bell will be in P3. We've got a little bit of a battle though. Kestiker coming down with Paulus. Oh my goodness, Pales <laughs> trying to be able to send it in. We saw an aggressive move from him earlier on and it just not quite able to get it. Almost contact coming down into the final left-hander. They'll bring it down to the right-hander and Kestiker able 
able to hold out to take eighth place away from Pales. Yeah, it's just, I, it was a little aggressive blocking around that final few corners, but I think it was just borderline fair. Like, when I say borderline, I mean within an inch of the regulations as uh, we look at Perea having even more incidents. I thought he actually finished the race and that's why he was doing donuts, but no, he's just having another incident. He's had a pretty, pretty poor race, to be honest, down in 15th. Uh, but uh, we had a few drivers making a lot of mistakes today. Sedgley probably being the biggest one out of all of those, having a dreadful, dreadful race. But at uh, the opposite end, Blanco just proving what he does best. That race start was absolutely impeccable compared to everyone else. He pulled away, didn't make any mistakes, and really did deserve the race victory today. Yeah, he most certainly did. Just putting on a clinic here, did Blanco. And let's also give some credit to Philip Vandenherk. I mean, he had that rough start at the drop of the green flag. Lost about, I think, three positions by my reckoning. But he really had to fight his way back and around. Uh, as we look at Christopher Lemayne here, one of the last drivers to cross over the line. Here is Perea coming down the Dottinger Hoa right now. He will be uh, one of the last drivers to finish the day out. Some damage to the right-hand side of that car. The front split looks like it's in decent condition. Still come down here through the right, left, right sequence. Very aggressive on the curbing, but uh, the Iberian driver will cross over the line to finish in 15th. Yeah, it kind of, kind of sums up his race, really. Too many mistakes from him. I mean, it is the Norse life. It is extremely difficult, but I mean, when, when you choose to race around here, you kind of have to expect a bit of a challenge. Unfortunate race for him, but... Yeah, Blanco putting on one of his best performances all season and really did make up for his blunders last week at Bathurst. And, well, yeah, as you were saying, Philip and uh, Dan really putting on a good show. And, yeah, I'll let you take it away with the results. Well, as we have been talking about it, once Rafael Blanco able to take victory over Phil Vandenherk, then Michael Bell, Albert Fuchs, and Dominic Gross round out your top five. It was Chris Redman in six, Lotte Sorensen able to move his way up through the field, gaining uh, what looks like seven positions on the day to finish in seventh. Linus Kastiger will finish in eighth, followed by Nicholas Pales. Then it was uh, Phil and Pritchard in P10. Uh, into 11 it was Enrico Bertot, followed by Johannes Hesterman, then Manu Casanovas, and uh, Christoph Lemayne. And Daniel Perea, uh, Ewan Bremer, Mika Hulkinen, uh, Marcus Ribzark uh, there, Daniel Sedgley, Pedro Amor, and Robert Woodward rounding out your 21-car grid. And Aaron, unfortunately, that sees us come to the end of another season here. Uh, as we look ahead to week 13 next time out, uh, we won't be racing next week, but we should be back uh, in two weeks' time as everything gets back and going. And uh, I, for one, am very excited to see this series come back. We have a sneaking suspicion that the Nordschleife will be the season finale yet again, but maybe some new tracks coming into the iRacing service. We may be able to see them on the schedule for next year. Yeah, I hope. I, I mean, a, a race, as we saw earlier, uh, if any of you have checked out iRacing's Twitter account, you would have seen that uh, Magnet Core has finally been announced uh, as joining the iRacing calendar next season. Uh, but we'll see if it will be on the calendar for the Radicals. I really do hope it will. I think it's an absolutely fantastic track, better than any other French track. <laughs> uh, Paul Ricard. But uh, yeah, I think Radicals around there will be an absolutely amazing race. And well, if it's not on the calendar, then I call sacrilege. But as you said, yeah, th this this track probably will be the last race of the season, as we have seen for, well, seasons on seasons. And as we saw today, it doesn't disappoint. No, it certainly does not. And uh, unfortunately here, it doesn't look like we have any drivers wanting to talk to us. I don't know if uh, if uh, they think we smell or something, but uh, not seeing anybody here coming on into the booth. So that's unfortunately going to wrap up our coverage here for today on Apex Racing TV. On behalf of myself, DJ Clark, as well as my commentary partner here, Aaron Smith, and Simone Kumo behind the scenes, it's been an absolute pleasure to bring you the racing action from the Nordschleife here today. And until we see you on the track, thanks for watching. Thank you.